All right, everybody, let's get started. Well, welcome to our encore presentation about the All-American Red Wolf. For those of you who didn't already know, it's Wolf Awareness Week, so this is the perfect week to give our encore presentation. I'm very excited that so many of you have joined us and done so from across the country today so that we can share with you the story of one of the species that we focus on here in the Southeast, the unique and wonderful All-American Red Wolf. I'm Maddie Watson, I'm a graduate student, and I'm also a Southeast field office intern for Defenders of Wildlife. I'll be guiding us through today's presentation, posting some trivia questions for you to have fun with, and I'll be introducing you to the members of our team who you'll be hearing from today. I'll be sharing my screen with you for a large portion of today's presentation, but let's make sure that when I'm not screen sharing, you can see each speaker. You'll see that you have a button in the top right corner of your Zoom window that says speaker view or gallery view. Go ahead and make sure that your setting is on speaker view. And feel free to post questions and comments in the chat box throughout the presentation and know that there will be a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So I'll go ahead and start screen sharing with everyone. Okay, so welcome to our Encore presentation. First, we'll hear from Tracy Davis, our Southeast Program Coordinator, who will give a brief overview of our work, a little Defenders 101, if you will, and then we'll jump into the world of Red Wolf Basics and the history of Red Wolf Recovery Program from Ben Prater, our Southeast Program Director, and Heather Clarkson, our Outreach Representative, will round out the conversation by telling us about the Red Wolf's current situation, threats that the wolves face, challenges we are experiencing on the ground, and the politics that have gotten us to where we find ourselves today. I promise you that this will not be all doom and gloom. There is indeed hope for the future and Defenders is leading the way. We'll wrap up by outlining both what we've done to turn this program around and save the All-American Red Wolf, and we'll let you know how you can help. Finally, we'll open the floor up to answer any questions that you have. So let's get started. Up first is Tracy Davis, again, our wonderful Southeast Program Coordinator based here in Asheville, North Carolina. Tracy leads outreach efforts for our field office and she created our wildlife workshops and walkabouts program of which this presentation is a part. Tracy, can you tell us a little bit about Defenders of Wildlife? Yes, uh, thank you, Maddie. And thank you all for joining us during National Wolf Awareness Week to learn more about one of our favorite canids, the All-American Red Wolf. Whether you're joining us today as a member of our growing network of activists or as a financial contributor or both, you play an important role in furthering the mission of Defenders of Wildlife, which is to protect all native plants and animals in their natural communities. Our approach to this is direct and straightforward. We work on the ground, in the courts and on Capitol Hill to protect and recover endangered and threatened species across this continent. Our work on the ground is the focus of our field conservation program that roots us in the ecosystems where we work, allows us to engage with people on conservation issues and implements uh, practical solutions on the ground. Our field coordination program spans from coast to coast, and we have field offices in Alaska, California, the Pacific Northwest, the Rockies and Plains, the Southwest, and here in the Southeast. There is a good reason that we have a field office here in the Southeast. For those of you who live here, uh, you probably know that we have mega biodiversity in the Southeast. We also have an exploding human population and very few protected lands. So that presents a whole host of challenges with regard to wildlife conservation. Within our region, we have some focal landscapes that help us to prioritize where we work. And I'll start from the bottom and work our way uh, clockwise around this map. Um, first is the greater Everglades. This is the home to the Florida panther and manatees. Next is the Florida panhandle, uh, which is home to the gopher tortoise and sea turtles. The Southern Appalachians are a global hotspot for amphibians and freshwater fish. 
And finally, the Carolina coast, which is home to the endangered red wolf. So from the ancient Appalachian mountains to the longleaf pine savannas of the coastal plain, to the river of grass known as the Florida Everglades, to the windswept dunes of the Atlantic coasts, this is the Southeast that we defend. And these are the people who are leading the charge on your behalf. From left to right, we have Kat Dearson in Asheville, North Carolina, Elizabeth Fleming, St. Petersburg, Florida, Christian Hunt, Charlotte, North Carolina, Ben Prater, Asheville, North Carolina, Heather Clarkson, Durham, North Carolina, Kent Wimmer, Tallahassee, Florida, and yours truly down in front in Asheville, North Carolina. Maddie, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our first trivia question. And thank you all again for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the presentation. The first trivia question, we're gonna have three trivia questions throughout this presentation. So let me go ahead and get the polling going. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see this poll. Uh, please select the answer that you believe to be the best choice. And after everybody has answered, we'll see how many of you chose the correct response and we'll give you about 30 seconds. So the correct answer is actually 20 miles. You guys heard that right? Red wolves can travel up to 20 miles a day in search of food. So it looks like 20 came in as the second most popular answer. Good job, everybody. So now with more interesting facts about red wolves is Ben Prater, our Southeast Program Director, who directs the Southeast Field Team and all of our programs. Ben, take it away. Uh, ben Prater here and excited to be uh, sharing a little bit more uh, with you today about red wolves, both some of their biology, and we'll also dive into the history of the red wolf recovery effort. Um, and I want to start with some basics. Uh, the red wolf, scientific name Canis rufus, is a native to the North American continent. In fact, we refer to the red wolf as all American because of all of the wolves in the world, the red wolf evolved uniquely right here in the southeastern United States. The red wolf is a canid of intermediate size uh, in between on the smaller end, the coyote, and on the larger end, the gray wolf, its two closest relatives. And uh, if we end the screen share, I've got some uh, faux animal skulls, some skull castings to show you all so that you can take a look. Uh, first up and smallest in size is the coyote, Canis latrans. Moving up in size is the red wolf, Canis rufus, and finally, largest of all, the gray wolf, Canis lupus. Now, we use skulls because skulls can help, from a biological perspective, tell you a lot about the animal which you're interested in. You can tell about its diet and even some indication of its behavior and the way it is adapted to its environment. Uh, mammals are especially uh, interesting to look at the skulls because of the fact that mammals uh, of all the animal kingdom have the most diverse sets of teeth that are out there. And those teeth can really tell us a lot about these creatures and how they are adapted to consume their preferred diet. Wolves, of course, as we know, are primarily carnivorous. So the wolf genus actually gets its name, uh, Canis, from the large canine teeth you can see here, top and bottom. Also, because they're a carnivore, if you look at the molars and premolars, uh, you see that they're very sharp edges and the ones towards the back are quite wide. Um, this allows for these teeth to function like heavy duty shears to cut and uh, consume uh, chunks of meat. And those large rear molars, still sharp, 
are uh, thick and able to crunch through bone as they consume animal material. If you were to compare these molars to even our own molars, we're of course a um, omnivore or other animals that are herbivores, they have wide and flat teeth meant for grinding and masticating plant material. Um, other unique features of the red wolf skull uh, and other uh, carnivores and canines, first you'll notice this uh, crest along the back of the skull. This is called the sagittal crest. And anytime you see these uh, processes or, or nodes off of a skull, this is where the muscles attach. So if you take your hand and put it right on your temple and clench your jaw, you'll feel that muscle move and close the jaw. We don't have a large crest along our heads, our jaw muscle actually attaches to the side uh, near the temple. And that means we have a relatively weak bite compared to other animals, which have this large crest or large surface area to attach larger, more powerful muscles. So again, these animals have a very strong bite. Other things to notice about this red wolf skull, if you look around um, the auditory section of the skull, you have these uh, proliferations of bone, these processes. And these again are where muscles and ligaments attach. And that tells us this animal has very keen sense of hearing because it's able to actually move its ears uh, to locate and pinpoint sound. We can also observe the long snout and large orbital openings, also letting us know that these animals have keen senses of sight and smell as well. So a little bit more about the biology, and although the exact diet of red wolves varies depending on the available prey, it usually consists of a combination of white-tailed deer, it's just its preferred prey source, and then other small mammals like raccoons, possums, rabbits, and other rodents. Um, and the red wolf, of course, is an opportunistic feeder, and as you all learned in our uh, trivia question, can travel to 20 miles a day in search of that food. Um, red wolves are mostly brown uh, and buff colored. Uh, unlike their name implies, they have very little red on them, but they do have reddish hue uh, on their ears, head, and legs. Uh, oftentimes, when people hear the term red wolf, they're typically featuring an animal more like a red fox, that bright red color. But Matt, let's go ahead and move the slide forward, please. Okay, and you're welcome to go ahead and advance a few more times to show those measurement bars. Um, adult red wolves are about 26 inches or just over two feet tall uh, from paw to shoulder height. And then from the nose to the tip of the tail, uh, they range from about four and a half to five and a half feet, five and a half feet long. They also range in weight. And that range is, uh, captures the, um, the range of size that we see between female, which are typically smaller, and male animals, which are typically larger. And that uh, size range uh, in weight goes from about 50 to 80 pounds. So for those of you who may own a large dog at home, like a German Shepherd or a Labrador Retriever, that's about the size of this animal. Now, red wolves live quite a challenging life as a carnivore. In fact, in the wild, they only live about six to seven years. So they have to grow up fast, learn their skills uh, quickly. Uh, they reach breeding age at roughly two years. Uh, but they can live up to 15 plus years in captivity. But one of the things that makes wolves of all kinds so wonderful, and red wolves are no exception, is they're very social animals, much like human beings. And they live in very close-knit packs or family groups. Now, you, when I say the word wolf pack, you may be thinking of something akin to, you know, 10 to 20 animals that you may see in gray wolves consisting of multiple, multiple families. But red wolf packs are much smaller typically consisting of no more than five to eight animals, all that include a breeding pair, a male and female. A breeding pair of wolves will in fact mate for life. Um, and they, and it's, uh, the pack also includes their offspring. Uh, and the older offspring, the yearlings, will often assist the breeding pair in pup rearing and helping to supply food and resources and protection to the pack. Um, and these animals mate once a year, uh, in late winter or February. And um, one of the most endearing qualities of wolves is their amazing social behaviors and family dynamics. And as you can see here, these adorable little balls of, of, of fluff um, are born about two months after the breeding season. 
And the litter of pups can range anywhere from two to eight pups. Generally, it's around four to six on average. Uh, again, these pups are born uh, in the early spring, April and May, and they're born into the world into well-hidden dens that may be located or dug out underneath hollow trees, stream banks, and even in the sand holes. Uh, we've even found dens uh, dug in um, the ground underneath uh, debris piles. But sadly, fewer than half of the wolf pups that are born each year actually survive into adulthood or to reach breeding age. Um, and of course, survival rates are affected by a lot of things, disease, malnutrition, and even predation. Um, but what's interesting in a technique that was developed for the recovery effort for red wolves is this idea of pup fostering. So during this time of the year, um, if dens can be located in the wild and the mother is only whelped uh, you know, two or, or three or even four pups, she has a, additional space in, in her litter, in her den. And so they will take, because these animals all um, breed and whelp during the same time of the year, they'll take those animals born in captivity under human care, transfer them into those dens in the wild, and they will be fostered and cared for by those foster wolves and raised amongst those wild wolves. This allows these animals to be raised with wild behaviors. Uh, they learn uh, from their uh, wild foster parents. And here is a photograph. It was a video uh, to begin with, but either way, this is uh, just to show you the, the love of the mother here. This um, was from our friends at the Durham Museum of Life and Science. And this is from last year when Carrie, this beautiful mother wolf, gave birth to six puppies, which is really incredible. Uh, all of those pups um, have now reached uh, maturity and are being used throughout uh, the uh, species survival program or the captive breeding program to help maintain genetics uh, for the next generation. And these pups you see here are about six to eight weeks old. They just emerged from the den and are beginning to explore the world around them. So Maddie, let's go ahead and kick it to our next slide and our next trivia question before we jump into a little more about the history of the Red Wolf program. Thanks, Ben. All right, everybody, let's gear up for our second trivia question. All right, where do you think that red wolves were first reintroduced from captivity into the wild? Again, you'll have about 30 seconds to answer this question, starting now. Right, looks like everybody almost got that right. Great job, everybody. 58% Eastern North Carolina is correct. Red wolves were first reintroduced from captivity into the wild in Eastern North Carolina. That's an interesting bit of red wolf trivia for you. So now I'll turn it back over to Ben to continue the conversation about red wolf history. So Ben, what else should we know about red wolf history? Sure thing. Well, let's take a look at the map, Maddie, the next slide. Okay, so as you look at this map, don't be too worried about the details, just to get a general sense here, uh, but you'll notice the yellow color. And this depicts what we refer to as the historic range of the species. And this is really our best approximation based only on the fossil record and the written record um, of where and to what extent red wolves once roamed across um, the United States. As you can see, it once covered a huge amount of territory in the US. Uh, and, and of course, the, the range extended across the entire southeastern United States. Uh, but unfortunately, a savage history of eradication and fear uh, makes up a part of the modern history of all predators in the United States. But fortunately, with shifting attitudes in the new age of conservation, efforts were conducted to save imperiled species from the brink. And the red wolf was one of the first species to benefit from those efforts. Um, if you look back to the map and notice the area, the small area in red along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Texas, this represents the last stronghold for red wolves that existed in the middle of last century. 
So around the 1950s and 60s, this was the only place left where red wolves could still be experienced in the wild. And at that time, biologists grew so concerned about losing the species to extinction that they worked to capture all the red wolves they could find in this area and remove them uh, from the wild in order to start a captive breeding program. This was the first of its kind, fairly radical uh, and progressive action to be taken. Uh, in fact, when red wolves were introduced into eastern North Carolina, they, um, which you can see, it's shown by the little box there along the coast of North Carolina. This was the first reintroduction, as you learned in the trivia question, of a predator on the landscape. This was truly an historic event that predated the reintroduction to the Yellowstone uh, in the 90s. And in fact, the Red Wolf Recovery Program and many of the techniques developed to make it successful served as the model for that Yellowstone reintroduction, which gets a lot of the fame. But again, the Red Wolves laid that ground and that foundation first. And as I mentioned, uh, when the effort to save Red Wolf began, there was really no blueprint to follow. Uh, so many of these biologists were basically cowboys uh, looking to um, solve a problem uh, with just trusting their gut and their instincts, and of course using science to lead the way. But by the, thought, by the time they had located just those few wolves, um, again, biologists concluded that the only way they could prevent extinction was to remove those survivors, place them in captivity. And this is an aerial shot of those first breeding pens that were set up at Point Defiance Zoo in Tacoma, Washington, out west. And this allowed for scientists and biologists to study the animals, and to begin to breed them in order to boost their numbers. Of course, at the time, the end goal was not just to preserve the species to prevent its extinction, but to actively restore it back to the wild. And again, no one had ever done this before. No one had ever taken a large carnivore from the wild and put it back and restored it to the landscape. And at that time, many people were skeptical if it was even possible, if the wolves would survive. Would they retain wild behaviors? Remember how to hunt, uh, be able to avoid people? Again, these were all unanswered questions, um, but the Fish and Wildlife Service at the time uh, was willing to take those risks, do what they could to restore a piece of our wild heritage to the landscape. So they had to start small and they did so on an island. Uh, in fact, two wolves, the first were, they were they were introduced to those island propagation sites it was done so on Bulls Island in Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge off the coast of South Carolina. And those first wolves, that first wolf pair did not do so well. They had trouble acclimating. They ended up swimming off the island, which created a bit of a problem. And they ended up in, interacting with people and they did not establish territories like, like others had hoped. So this put the Fish and Wildlife Service back to the drawing board. But eventually they were able to establish another pair on the same island who got it right? They hunted, established territory, and proved above all else that the red wolf could in fact be reintroduced successfully. One of those wolves was named John, who you see here. Uh, this is a, a fascinating photograph because at first glance, it looks as if this animal is running across the water, which may seem odd. We tend to associate wolves with you know, mountains and rugged forested landscape. But remember this wolf across the Southeast was a wolf that was on the coast, uh, one that once regularly could be found on eastern beaches. But as a result of the success on Bulls Island, the Fish and Wildlife Service began to look at a place to establish a larger population in eastern North Carolina, one that they hoped could be self-sustaining, which is one of the marquees of recovery. So in order to do that, in order to really boost those numbers, they had to breed these animals. And they couldn't just do it in one location. They are started seeking support from other uh, zoos, facilities that were equipped for good conservation and captivity. And as of today, the number of facilities that are part of the species survival program are over 45. So quite a Herculean effort, all in an effort again to boost numbers, maintain genetic integrity, and again with the ultimate goal of restoring these wolves to the wild. So let's zoom in on the next slide to the landscape where we reintroduce the species. Now, it's important to point out a stark difference between the red wolf program and the program in Yellowstone. Red wolves don't benefit from having a huge national park 
surrounded by other public lands. Uh, if you look at this current range, uh, the landscape of public lands, which are those lands in green, um, and private lands are in gray, you can see it's a bit of a mismatch. Um, this really illustrates the fact that private lands and private landowners are going to be critical to the success of the program. And it's important as we work to reach those private landowners that we understand that wolves are a part of the ecosystem. They are a benefit to the land. They help reduce populations of pests, which thereby reduces crop damage for farmers. It's also believed, unfortunately, anecdotally, we don't have hard science on this, but that we've seen improved nest success for ground nesting birds like turkeys and quail, as wolves have helped to keep the populations of mesocarnivores low and nest predators low. We also believe that uh, red wolves have helped to improve the deer herd, again, by preying on the sick and weak and enhancing the genetic stock for those wolves. But of course, wolves left with their own devices still face numerous threats, many of which are unfortunately only increasing. One of the main ones is human-caused mortality. And within that category, we want things like vehicle strikes, uh, gunshots, even poaching. Um, and aside from just reducing numbers outright, there's a really significant impact that the loss of a breeding animal can have on the wolf population. As you'll recall, a wolf pack consists of two breeders. If one of those breeders are lost, those animals in that pack may end up disintegrating. Um, and so when you combine these threats with ongoing habitat fragmentation from increased development, as well as sea level rise, um, these things have allowed coyotes to expand uh, into the area. And while coyotes um, aren't necessarily best equipped to directly compete with wolves for resources, uh, they do introduce diseases and they have been seen to dilute the genetic lineages of red wolves through hybridization. And again, this is particularly true when a pack loses one of those breeding animals. Uh, oftentimes that instinct to breed is so strong that the female wolves will take up with whatever canid is in their, in their territory, which can sometimes unfortunately be a coyote. So again, complex challenges, myriad threats, but the red wolves have their place in the wild. Uh, but let's go on to look at the next slide to see kind of where this program has gone. So over the years, if you follow this graph, this actually shows the population of red wolves over time. You can see that for a majority of the time, uh, the numbers of red wolves exceeded 100 animals, uh, a robust and healthy population that was continuing to grow. Unfortunately, that shifted uh, due to some changes in policies and local politics. One of the most significant changes was that the state of North Carolina liberalized hunting regulations uh, for coyotes, seeing them as a pest species. And as they began to move into the area, they allowed for coyote uh, hunting season to extend year round, even into nighttime hours, which led to um, a significant amount of red wolves being shot at night as it became nearly impossible to distinguish between juvenile red wolves and mature coyotes. And with that precipitous decline, organizations like Defenders of Wildlife and others stepped in to put a halt to that practice and had to do so through litigation. You know, as Tracy mentioned, we do take the court of law as a strategy for helping to conserve species. But since that time and some of the fallout to that litigation have left many to turn their back on the program. And we continue to see a steady decline in the population. And most significantly, the Fish and Wildlife Service themselves began to take a turn away from the program. We saw a decrease in financial investment, a decrease in the number of personnel focused on the program, and even the Fish and Wildlife Service committed itself to only the exercises of pushing papers of how to deal with the species versus robust and um, meaningful and proven strategies on the ground to conserve them. So when I say that we have reached another critical and dire situation, I am not being hyperbolic. It is true. But as Maddie reminded us, there is absolutely hope. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Heather after this next trivia question to talk about uh, that hope for the future. So Maddie, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Ben. All right, everybody, I'm going to launch our third and final trivia question. 
All right, so according to an independent poll, what percentage of North Carolinians do you think support red wolf conservation? We'll have about 30 seconds, starting now with our nice little music. So an overwhelming majority of you got that correct. Way to go, everybody. 70% of North Carolinians support red wolf conservation. With that many supporters in our state, I'm curious to know why the red wolf continues to struggle, aren't you? So here to help us with the answers and tell us what we can do to help is Heather Clarkson, our Southeast Outreach Representative. And she works with local communities, landowners, as well as state and federal lawmakers and regulatory agencies to promote and support the Red Wolf Recovery Program in Eastern North Carolina. Take it away, Heather. Thanks, Maddie. Um, so really quickly before I get started, I am seeing some questions come into our Q&A section, um, which is really awesome. We are going to probably answer most of them at the end. So please continue to put your questions in the box um, and we'll answer as many as we have time for at the end of the presentation. All right. So we have filled you guys in on the history and the past of red wolves, um, but big question I'm sure you all have is what about the future? Um, so what has Defenders been doing to secure the future for this species? We've been taking a three-pronged approach. Um, first, we've been building and leveraging public support focused mostly in North Carolina and on the ground locally around the recovery area. Second, we've been holding agencies accountable through litigation and legal strategies, um, including Endangered Species Act defense. And then third, we've been utilizing science to inform our decision making. Despite the significant turning point that our red wolves are at in recovery, we are standing by the wolves and the vast majority of North Carolinians are supporting them. Um, as we just found out from our polls, every Every time we run a poll on the state of North Carolina, our, our supporters are over 70%. And, and that rings even stronger on a national level. Um, we are continuing our grassroots effort in North Carolina, ramping up political outreach, and we're committed to bringing the best available science to bear and enforcing the law when it comes to the Endangered Species Act. We have staff working in every corner of North Carolina and beyond. And the state North Carolina capital where we are in close proximity to decision makers, agency personnel, and the recovery area. In 2019, we were able to secure Governor Cooper's support for red wolf conservation in North Carolina. And we helped to get over 100,000 signatures in support of red wolf recovery, pushing back against the Fish and Wildlife's bad proposal. Another way that we've been working to increase outreach is through education. Through a partnership with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation and the Wildlife Refuges Association, we helped reopen the Red Wolf Center in Columbia, North Carolina. This facility houses multiple captive wolves and is manned by, uh, by volunteers throughout the year who educate guests on red wolves and their recovery. Um, this facility is in, like I said, Columbia, North Carolina. It's in the heart of the recovery area and um, has been a significant draw for um, tourists lately. So pictured here, we have um, a number of our outreach projects and I'm gonna uh, go through them all pretty quickly for you guys. So in our top two corners um, is actually a recent wildlife ambassadors meeting that we held at the Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge um, that is there in Columbia, North Carolina. Um, this was a group of, of local landowners and um, community activists who wanted to be more involved in protecting not only the red wolf, but the entire ecosystem um, surrounding these refuges. Um, there in the middle, the top middle, uh, Tracy and I tabling at the Southern, um, the Southeastern Wildlife Exposition, which is held every year in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, for the past, I think, four years now, we've gone every single year and tabled at this event, which has allowed us to speak to um, hundreds of people every single year. This event usually has more than 40,000 attendees every single year. Um, there in the bottom left is um, 
a really cool project we did. Uh, we installed billboards in two different locations in North Carolina to, um, first of all, let visitors to our state know about the Red Wolf and, and the really cool thing we've got going on here, but also to help direct them to that Red Wolf Education Center. Um, so that they could go there, they could see the wolves in person and learn more about them from the refuge volunteers. We have held a concert for conservation. You'll see the flyer there in the bottom right. Um, that was an excellent way uh, for us to connect artists and music lovers and people of faith in Western North Carolina who wanted to support conservation and support the Red Wolf. And then uh, last but not least, uh, there in the middle, um, is Dale Weiler of Weiler Woods for Wildlife. And he's actually going to join us um, in the next slide to uh, tell us a little more about his inspiration with Red Wolves. Hi, I'm Lodi Woods. And I'm Dale Weiler. And together we are Weiler Woods for Wildlife. Lodi and I have a passion for protecting the underdogs in the wildlife kingdom. And in our minds, the Red Wolf leads the pack. We first were introduced to Red Wolves at the North Carolina Zoo several years ago when we were taken behind the scenes and it got to meet three brand new red wolf puppies mm. and it was love at first sight and we then learned that the only wild red wolves live in our home state of North Carolina and they're critically endangered with less than right now I guess 10 or 12 in the wild so we knew we had to do something to try to help this species that's native to North America. Um, we came home and Dale just happens to be a wildlife sculptor. So I looked in my stone pile and found the perfect stone to create a mother red wolf and her pup. And after I completed it, Lodi and I decided that we wanted to do a replica of that original and donate it to facilities around the country who are helping to rewild red wolves. And this happens to be one of the uh, replicas that has been donated. But we got together with Ben Prater, Defenders of Wildlife. We had been working with Defenders on a number of different underdog species. And we did some brainstorming and collectively came up with the idea of offering these replicas to uh, breeding facilities of red wolves around the country. And uh, Defenders of Wildlife sponsored five of the caskets or replicas uh, to those facilities and we have been so inspired uh, working with Ben and his team um, in the southeast and also with the uh, home office defenders folks and what we've found is any action you take no matter how small or how big can make a huge difference in wildlife conservation so in conclusion we both like to say go red go wolves, wolves. I love that video. All right. Well, thanks, Daniel and Lodi. Um, so we mentioned science as one of the lenses that we are looking um, toward the future through. In fact, Defenders is a science-based organization at its heart. We are focusing on the science and human dimensions to develop a comprehensive vision for the Red Wolf recovery effort, which will engage leading scientists and work with landowners and local communities through incentive programs and coexistence strategies. Um, we are leading with partners such such as the Smithsonian and the Association for Zoos and Aquariums to build scientific understanding, address conservation challenges, advance recovery planning, and identify new recovery sites. So you'll remember we put up the historical range um, a couple slides back and that little red arrow with the source population. Um, that is basically Northeastern Texas, Southern Louisiana, um, super swampy area, but that's where the last of the red wolves were pulled out of um, back in the 60s and 70s. So Maddie, if you will click one more. Now, you'll have to exclude, um, excuse the resolution because this photo was taken at a distance, but this is a recent photo from Galveston Island, Texas. Um, recent years have actually brought to light some very groundbreaking research on wild canids. Uh, red wolf genes have been discovered to be persisting in the wild in both Texas and Louisiana. Um, these animals here that you see in the photo, like I said, were found on Galveston Island. And we also have had other animals found um, in the swamps of Louisiana. And both these populations have come back with unique um, red wolf DNA that is actually not even represented in the captive population at this point. 
Um, this means a couple of different things. It means that red wolf genes, whether we uh, thought so or not, they have survived on the landscape, both in the presence of coyotes and with no human intervention whatsoever. Um, this turns some of the you know, classic arguments on how impossible red wolf conservation may be on its head. Um, this also has implications for policy and the implementation of the Endangered Species Act. Um, right now, there is no mechanism in the Endangered Species Act to address um, hybrids or uh, issues like this that will come up naturally on the landscape. Um, this is still very much evolving science and defenders will continue to be in the vanguard as we learn more about these two new populations of, of canids. So today marks a new dawn for red wolves. Um, never before has there been such public, such strong public support for red wolves or such incredible partnerships on the ground supporting the species. Um, the responsibility now rests on our state and federal wildlife agencies. Defenders is headed back to court. Um, we are headed back to encourage fish and wildlife to recommit to this species in the next administration and recommit to recovery. There will be no future for red wolves without more releases from the captive populations, pup fostering, and more recovery areas identified. So you're all wondering, what can you do to help? Um, here are five quick actions that you can take, and we will definitely send this out to you guys after the presentation because I do think the bottom's cut off. But um, speak up, take action, uh, send letters to your congressional representatives or to your um, local wildlife agency, especially if you're in North Carolina. Uh, social media, use the social media platforms that you're on and that you're active with and spread the word and educate others about this species. You can write a letter to the editor to your local paper, especially if you are in an area within the historical range. Um, we, uh, we eventually would love to see these animals back on the landscape that they were historically a part of. You can join us on social media. We have a Defenders of Wildlife um, dedicated red wolf group just for um, keeping our supporters up to date on red wolves. So that URL is actually what's cut off at the very bottom. So we'll make sure you guys get a copy of it after the, after the presentation. And then of course, um, last but not least, support the red wolf program. Go visit the zoos and facilities that have red wolves. Um, I know that right now it's COVID and it's weird, but um, anything you can do to support those breeding facilities is a huge help. Um, they really actually do not get any help from the government or from Fish and Wildlife when it comes to keeping those animals in their care. So that's um, something we always want to encourage red wolf lovers and supporters to do is help support the SSP, the, spe the Species Survival Plan as well. All right, uh, that is all for me. Turning it back over to Maddie. Thanks, Heather. All right, everybody, we are going to launch our final polling question. Unlike the previous three, this is just a polling question, not a trivia question. So we are asking you guys, which of the following advocacy items are you willing to do for the protection and recovery of the All-American Red Wolf? Choose as many as you like. And again, I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> whatever you can to support the Red Wolf. And we would just like to say thank you so much uh, for participating in these fun trivia questions and in this polling question. And anything that you can do to help Red Wolf recovery and conservation is a victory in and of itself. And it's much appreciated by all of us here at Defenders of Wildlife. Your support can make a big difference no matter what you do. Um, let's see, we'll go ahead and Start with Scott's question. So why isn't the Smoky Mountain National Park vi a viable location for reintroduction? Um, does anybody want to take the answer to this interesting question? Hey, Maddie. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in because actually the uh, Smoky Mountains was not only considered, it was actually used as the second 
uh, potential reintroduction site. In fact, in the early 90s, uh, there was a reintroduction effort where they put a few animals out into the Smokies. At that time, uh, those animals did run into a few different challenges. Uh, there was, there was uh, overall lack of an abundance of prey in the rugged mountain terrain. And that rugged terrain also prevented biologists, or at least made it more difficult for biologists to locate and access uh, the animals to be able to provide them with uh, veterinary care. And again, we're talking wild animals, so you may be wondering why do we have veterinary care? Well, that's because um, wild canids are susceptible to domestic dog diseases like parvo. And so it's very important uh, for such a critically endangered species that we can uh, provide care and vaccination against these diseases, which again are human caused fundamentally. Um, so those were some, some challenges. There was also uh, some vocal opposition from uh, private landowners adjacent to the park uh, who owned cattle, even though in the history of the program, depredation on livestock is um, uh, essentially null, uh, did create an optics issue with Fish and Wildlife Service. So after they lost a number of those animals to disease, they decided to um, uh, end that program in the Smokies. And um, because they ended that program in the Smokies, it left us, you know, there was not much of an insurance policy. And so we put a lot of onus on that single wild population left in East North Carolina. And we do not want to see the Fish Wildlife Service um, begin to get on a path towards giving up on that population as well. Um, so that's why we're holding the line. Uh, I would uh, tend to argue and believe that one of the challenges for the Smokies was the terrain itself. You know, again, we often in our mind's eye imagine these predators to be, you know, galloping along the rocky crags of the Smokies. But in truth, um, you know, carnivores uh, go where it's easy to take prey, which is why they are attracted to those flat landscapes and river bottoms, which guess who else is attracted to that? Farmers and human beings. So it creates a coexistence challenge. But yes, the Smokies, um, may again one day be a viable location. And I do think that public lands in general uh, really are the key for us to establish the population. Thanks, Ben. All right, let's move on to another question. Let's see, David Burns asked, I noticed that the different pens in the Tacoma Breeding Center each have rather different characteristics of trees, et cetera. Was that purposeful? So my assumption is, well, the answer is I don't know. My assumption is that, um, you know, with captive scenarios, um, biologists and zoologists are very uh, careful to provide uh, habitat that is a close approximation of their wild habitat. And that includes making sure that the animals have variety and diversity of items that are in their, in their enclosures. And I think it was probably less of a planned exercise and more of just a um, you know, natural benefit of putting the pens where they were. Uh, but yeah, that is something that you'll see if you visit uh, different uh, SSP facilities is how they've set up their, their uh, habitats for red wolves to be engaging and provide uh, support to maintain wild behaviors. All right, let's see. Shannon is asking, how successful has the cross fostering program been for uh, increasing the population? The answer is yes, cross fostering has been um, very successful. I do not have the numbers right off the top of my head of how many have been, um, you know, released into the North Carolina recovery area through cross fostering, but there has never been an instance of a failed cross fostering attempt. Um, there has never been, um, there are no examples of a mother wolf in the wild rejecting those puppies. And um, actually just this year, the SSP had a cross fostering um, internally. They, they had a medical issue with one of their captive born litters and lost a number of puppies and were able to cross foster the surviving puppies into another captive litter um, in order to save them. So it, it's interesting that not only it allows us to, to swap genetics and increase populations in the wild, but we can also do the same in our captive population. Yeah, red wolves make great parents. Um, again, those family dynamics are really uh, unique and admirable quality of their species. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny, they, the way they um, put those uh, pups in the den, so typically 
you know, a biologist comes along and immediately the mother wolf will leave the den. You know, her, her life matters first. <laughs> um, but what they'll do is they'll take some urine from the other puppies and basically just cover the scent of that new, new pup. And when the mother comes back, all she can detect and smell is uh, an extra warm body there. So um, it's amazing how simple things like that can really work and be such an effective tool for conservation. Thank you, Ben and Heather. Let's see some other great questions. You guys have been typing in wonderful questions in the chat box. So many good questions to choose from. Let's see which one comes up next. Um, so Rosemary Holt is asking, are there red wolves in, Me in Mexico? If so, what is their status? So Rosemary, I can answer that real quick. There are no red wolves in Mexico, but there is another subspecies of the gray wolf, the Mexican gray wolf. Um, and they are also endangered. And Defenders does wonderful work as well, promoting the recovery of the Mexican gray wolf population. Uh, we have a species page up on our website, that's defenders.org. Definitely go check that out if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help the Mexican gray wolf. So let's see, other great questions. Suzanne is asking, if a yearling disperses and returns to its original pack, would the breeding pair recognize its offspring or would this returning wolf be viewed as a challenger and chased away? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, it's it's uh, true that a lot of the observed behavior of red wolves is somewhat limited. Uh, they have not been as intensely studied as gray wolves. My um, my understanding of gray wolf behavior would lead me to believe that a, a female wolf um, who came back to her natal pack would probably more be more accepted than um, the male wolf. Um, and and yeah, it's just kind of based on what I know about gray wolf behavior, but generally once those animals disperse, they're not gonna be coming back. Now, they may overlap territory and they may interact um, uh, every once in a while, but generally that dispersal is for a very specific biological reason, which is to maintain um, and establish enough territory to feed the family and feed the young. So um, it's, probably not a common scenario where uh, a yearling or a dispersing animal will come back to its native pack. That's not to say it couldn't happen. Uh, and I don't quite know how um, that animal would be welcomed back into the pack. It may depend on just the characteristics of, of that particular pack. But, uh, you know, again, these are animals that have families that are uh, related. And I'm sure those relationships via scent and other forms of communication, um, you know, last long after uh, animals disperse. Thanks, Ben. All right, everybody. We probably have time for about one more question to answer live. Um, Amanda asks a really great, great question about the future and climate change. She asks, Has, as climate change continues to drive sea level rise, are plans being made in preparation for eventual inundation of the current reintroduction area? Yes, great question. So um, here's what we know. We do know that sea level rise is of course happening and it is affecting the Atlantic coast. We also know that due to the low lying uh, nature of the Albemarle Peninsula, that it is one of the most likely um, areas of the state to be inundated well inland. But what we also know is that there's plenty of high ground available and that red wolves, like all wolves, are highly adaptable and quite frankly, have given enough space and habitat will migrate out and do just fine. So one of the things that we're trying to do uh, is ensure that that habitat is available to them. So we're doing that in a couple of ways. The first is working locally in the Albemarle Peninsula to ensure the protection of corridors and connected habitats that allow these, will allow these animals, not just wolves, but all wildlife, to immigrate and move to other wild places that are sheltered from rising seas. The other thing we're doing is really focused on um, the, the term we use in the recovery parlance is redundancy. So one of the best ways that you can ensure that a species survives, even challenging climate, climatic level events, is to have other populations established and secured in other places across their historic range. And so having that insurance policy will make sure that whatever acre we might lose on one end, we're making gains on other ends. So 
I hope that answers it a bit, but yes, it is one of those um, threats that exist, but it's not one that we don't, that we're not equipped to deal with. Um, and of course, those are all responses to rising seas. Of course, the other proactive side of that is working on policies that reduce CO2 emissions and help us you know, get back on track with our various international agreements and work to minimize those impacts, even though we're beginning to see them on the refuge itself. So uh, lots to be done there and certainly a threat we're looking to address. All right, thanks, Ben. Well, we do wanna honor everybody's time commitment today, um, but so many of you asked wonderful questions in the chat box that we didn't get to answer, unfortunately. But if you are still just itching to have your question answered, please send us an email at southeastoffice at defenders.org. We'll include that in the follow-up email that we send to you guys. Um, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come sit with us and learn about red wolves and continue the conversation about red wolf conservation. Thanks to our amazing Southeast field team for teaching us all about red wolves. And again, most of all, thank you to our lovely audience members for tuning in today. We greatly appreciate your support and hope to see you on another webinar soon. Thanks everybody. Thank you.